A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with sublimity of words or of wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Febum Domini. Lord, I love your commands. How I love your law, O Lord, it is my meditation all the day. Your command has made me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, when your decrees are my meditation. I have more discernment than the elders, because I observe, I observe your precepts. From every evil way I withhold my feet, that I may keep your words. From your ordinances I turn not away, for you have instructed me. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord." Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today the scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Is this not the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me this proverb, Physician, cure yourself, and say, Do here in your native place the things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said, Amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was closed for three and a half years and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were all filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. 
but he passed through the midst of them and went away. Verbum Domini. The Alleluia verse for today was taken from the gospel, from Isaiah's prophecy that Lord, the Lord said was fulfilled in his proclamation of it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the poor. <clears throat> if you go to EWTN's website and you click on the radio section, they have some testimonies there. And here's one of those testimonies from a woman named Margaret from Pennsylvania. And she said, two years ago, I traveled to Guyana, South America, on a mission trip with a group out of the Scranton Diocese. We visited Malachi Hospital, and I had the honor of spending the entire afternoon with a gentleman named Christopher. Christopher, a man in his 50s, had leprosy since he was 11. He had no fingers, missing one leg entirely, and the other only to the knee. Yet he was a man filled with joy. He told me the first thing he does when he wakes is turn on his radio to EWTN. The last thing at night, he turns it off. When I returned to America, I tuned in to EWTN so that I could begin to learn more about my beloved faith and to find the joy known to Christopher. Thank you, EWTN Radio and Mother Angelica from Christopher and me. What is it that motivates someone to travel from Scranton, Pennsylvania, all the way to Guyana, South America, and to spend time with lepers. On a natural level, that's something repulsive to our nature. St. Francis, when he was uh, living in the 13th century, he found this very repulsive. But he said that the Lord took something that was bitter to him and he made it sweet. And so that the rest of his life, he often served the lepers. What is it that motivates a woman to go from Scranton to go and to spend time with lepers in South America. What is it as well that can give a man who has no fingers, missing entirely one leg, another one all the way up to the knee is gone, and yet she describes him as a man full of joy? What is it that can give a man in that physical state joy? And what we see here are flowers. I'd like to use that image today to think of the beauty of a flower. These are beautiful flowers. But if you look at a flower, in order for that flower to bloom and to flourish, it has to be deeply rooted. And you can't just cut that flower off from its root. We do that because we like to bring them into our homes, but unless we're watering them, giving them vitamins and whatever, they quickly wither and they die and it can become something quite disfigured and even ugly. So we see these beautiful fruits of this charity that would motivate a woman to travel so far to work with lepers. And we see the beautiful fruits of something, a message that comes through the radio that could give a man in such a physical plight joy and meaning and purpose in his own life. These are the flowers. Let us look at what is the root. We can't sever those flowers from the root without destroying the flower. We look at the civilization that we enjoy in the West, that we have representative government, and we separate powers so that no one has too much authority. We know what man is capable of, that absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
And so we have representative government by the people, for the people, separation of powers, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, an awareness that each human person has a dignity and they have rights as human beings to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. These are all beautiful flowers that have sprung from a much deeper root. You see, not every civilization in human history has enjoyed the things that we enjoy. We take them for granted because we've always known them, many of us, uh, all of us really who have lived in America all of our lives. We take these things for granted as if this is the way it's always been and always will be. But these are flowers of something that is much deeper, that has not been something that has been enjoyed universally in all human history, the recognition that every human person has rights and dignities that we would have a representative government, that we should have freedom to follow our conscience, freedom to practice our religion, freedom to be able to speak the truth. And that we see in the West a unity among Western nations, charitable works, health care, a law that's based on justice and truth. These are all flowers. And the reason that I begin this way is because of a talk recently that Archbishop Charles Chaput gave in Slovakia last Tuesday, August 24th. He addressed the Canon Law Association in Slovakia. And he talked about in, in Slovakia how they knew what the cost of living their Christian faith was. They had lived for 50 years under repressive Nazism and Soviet governments. They knew the cost of being faithful to their Christian faith. Many of them were martyred. Many of them shed their blood. And they knew what it was like to live under that kind of repression. But he says many Catholics in the United States and Western Europe today simply don't understand those costs, they don't, nor do they seem to care. And as a result, many are indifferent to the process in our countries that social scientists like to call secularization, but which in practice involves repudiating the Christian roots, our Christian roots and the soul of our civilization. That our founders were those who believe that a free people cannot remain free without religious faith and that the virtues and the virtues that that faith fosters. They had no desire for a radically secularized public life. They had no intent to lock religion away from public affairs. They wanted to guarantee citizens the freedom to live their faith publicly and vigorously and to bring their religious convictions to bear on the building of a just society. And he would quote the uh, well-known Frenchman who had traveled to the United States in the early 1800s, Alexis de Tocqueville, in his book, Democracy in America. And here's what he wrote. He says, despotism can do without faith, but liberty cannot. What is to be done with a people that is its own master if it's not obedient to God? And so we live today, Archbishop Chaput says, in a we're facing an aggressively secular political vision that we saw the Enlightenment bring about, give rise to great murder ideologies in the past century. But this, this view, this worldview, is still very much alive. Even though its language is softer, its intentions seem kinder, and its face is friendlier, the underlying impulse hasn't changed. The dream of building a society apart from God, a world where men and women might live wholly sufficient unto themselves, satisfying their needs and desires through their own ingenuity. And so in our own country, the United States, where 80% of the people are Christians, we now see increasingly, he says, dictated to the church how her ministries should operate, forcing some 
to practices that would destroy their Catholic identity, the adoption agency in Boston. Efforts made to criminalize the expression of certain Catholic beliefs as hate speech. The desire to undermine marriage and family life and to seek to scrub our public life of Christian symbolism and signs of influence. In Europe, we see a more open contempt for Christianity. You may recall, he said, one of the leading Catholic politicians, Rocco Bottiglioni, who was denied a leadership post in the European Union because of his Catholic beliefs. He says there are really two big lies that are being propagated today, that ideas have consequences and bad ideas have bad consequences. And so here, here are the two biggest lies that are being propagated today. First, that Christianity was a relatively minor importance in the development of the West. When you look at the development of the West and our culture and all of these things that I enjoy, these flowers that I spoke about at the beginning, to deny, this is the big lie, to deny that Christianity was what built that, which is the root of that, that enabled all of these beautiful flowers to flourish. The second lie, he says, is that our Western values and institutions can be sustained without a grounding in Christian moral principles. If we say we no longer need our Christian moral principles, and we say we we think that our, our institutions can survive, that freedom can survive, what we're going to see is that the only way where it's going to lead us is to greater and greater repression. Archbishop Chaput says, the church needs to name and fight these lies. To be a European or an American is to be heir to a profound Christian synthesis of Greek philosophy and art, Roman law, and biblical truth. This synthesis gave rise to the Christian humanism that undergirds all Western civilization. On this point, we might remember the German Lutheran scholar and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote these words in the months leading up to his arrest by the Gestapo in 1943. The unity of the West is not an idea, but a historical reality of which the sole foundation is Christ. Our societies in the West are Christian by birth, and their survival depends on the endurance of Christian values. Our core principles and political institutions are based in large measure on the morality of the gospel and Christian vision of man and government. We are talking here not only about Christian theology or religious ideas, we're talking about the moorings of our societies representative government, the separation of powers, freedom of religion and conscience, and most importantly, the dignity of the human person. This truth about the essential unity of the West has a corollary, as Bonhoeffer has also observed, take away Christ, and you remove the only reliable foundation of our values, institutions, and way of life. St. Paul understood this, so profoundly that he said, I determined that I would speak of nothing but Christ and him crucified. We heard in today's first reading. He is the source of unity. And our Christian faith is that root that has enabled these beautiful flowers that we enjoy and we take for granted today and we're allowing to be taken away from us by this powerful move of secularization because Maybe we've never experienced what it's like to be under repression before. We don't see what's really being taken away from us, the very underpinnings of all of these beautiful flowers that we enjoy. In the name of tolerance, we've come to tolerate the cruelest intolerance. Respect for other cultures comes to dictate disparagement 
of our own. Relativism is now the civil religion and public philosophy of the West. But relativism, and he quotes a uh, social philosopher of the 1960s, an American, well, eventually, the only way, if we live a relativism, it eventually leads to repression. That's the only way that philosophy can play out. Archbishop Chapu points out how we can see also that society itself, without this moral underpinning of the gospel, of our Christian heritage, he says there's no inherently logical or utilitarian reason why society should respect the rights of the human person. There's even less reason for recognizing the rights of those whose lives impose burdens on others, as is the case with the child in the womb, the terminally ill, or the physically or mentally disabled. You know, if you're going to social engineer things so that the society is going to flourish, then you're going to say, this is something that needs to be done away with. Those that are weak, those that are imposing burdens on society, there's no reason, unless you have a moral uh, founding on Christian moral principles to recognize the dignity of even the weakest, even the leper in South America who has no fingers or feet, that you can recognize that dignity. But if you separate God, and that's the, the whole movement, is just to remove God from our society, then where is society going to head? There's no other reason for them to uphold the dignity of the person. And he continues, what is legalized abortion but a form of intimate violence that clothes itself in democracy? The will to power of the strong is given the force of law to kill the weak. That is where we are heading in the West today. Writing in the 1960s, Richard Weaver, an American scholar and social philosopher, said, I'm absolutely convinced that relativism must eventually lead to a regime of force. The temptation in every age of the church is to try to get along with Caesar. And it's very true. Scripture tells us to respect and pray for our leaders. We need to have a healthy love for our countries we call home. But we can never render unto Caesar what belongs to God. We need to obey God first. The obligations of political authority always come second. We cannot collaborate with evil without gradually becoming evil ourselves. This is the one most vividly harsh lesson of the 20th century. And it's a lesson that I hope we have learned. And then he concludes... The world urgently needs a reawakening reawakening of the church in our actions and in our public and private witness. The world needs each of us to come to a deeper experience of our risen Lord in the company of our fellow believers. The renewal of the West depends overwhelmingly on our faithfulness to Jesus Christ and his church. We need to really believe what we say we believe. Then we need to prove it by the witness of our lives. We need to be so convinced of the truths of the creed that we are on fire to live these truths, to love these truths, and to defend these truths, even to the point of our own discomfort and suffering. We are ambassadors of the living God to a world that is on the verge of forgetting him. Our work is to make God real, to be the face of his love, Let us preach Jesus Christ with all the energy of our lives and let us support each other, whatever the cost, so that when we make our accounting to the Lord, we will be numbered among the faithful and courageous and not the cowardly or the evasive or those who compromised until there was nothing left of their convictions or those who were silent when they should have spoken the right word at the right time. Powerful message for all of us to listen to and to take to heart today. 
that we all have a part to play in restoring, keeping that flowers, those beautiful flowers that we enjoy, and in some places that are withering up and dying because they're being disconnected from the root, the root of our Christian heritage of Christ and him crucified. That's what's brought about these beautiful fruits that we all enjoy. May we never be robbed of them. And if each, each of us have the courage to take our part in whatever way the Lord wants to use us to protect our, our society so that these flowers may flourish for generations to come.